This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The Bible is a book by God and about God and the relationship He wants to have with you. In this study of Spotlight on the Word, looking at the Old Testament, a general introduction to the Old Testament, we're going to be looking at a couple of books from a section of the Old Testament called the Books of Poetry. And there are five of them in all. There's the book of Job. There's the book of Psalms, there's the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then Song of Solomon. Today we'll be looking especially at Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. But it's amazing, it's striking how all five of these books deal with some of the most profound, some of the most important subjects that man could ever contemplate, that we might ever think about. When you look at the book of Job, Job deals with the subject of God and suffering. God and suffering. And suffering is a fact that we have to face in this world. Job deals with God and suffering. Then we come to the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms deals with God and worship. God and praise. We were made to crave a relationship with God, to worship and praise someone or something. And the book of Psalms marvelously deals with the fact that we are to worship and praise God. It is the song book, the hymn book of the Old Testament. Then we come to the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs in its 31 chapters deals with God and wisdom. God and wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and a knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. And what happens in the book of Proverbs is this. We see that true wisdom is only to be found by seeking God and His ways. Then we come to the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes has 12 chapters in our translations. Ecclesiastes deals with God and meaning and purpose. A purpose that is so great and wonderful. People who try to live their lives apart from any relationship with God are people who lack true purpose and meaning in their lives. We'll see this more momentarily. Then we come to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon deals with God and married love. It is amazing how much the Word of God has to say about the love that should exist between a husband and wife, the love that should exist within marriage, because God is the master architect and or originator of marriage. It's so important that we respect God and His Word, what He has to say about the greatness of married love. Let's take a little bit of time and focus now on the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, and again, the book basically says that life is vain and empty and futile apart from giving God His proper place. What a powerful message the book of Ecclesiastes has to a very materialistic age. Remember the words of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride, the vainglory of life, these things are not of God but of the world, and as such they will pass away. The book of Ecclesiastes then deals with the futility and vanity and emptiness of life when it's lived as though there were no God. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, there are three or four key words, key expressions that really help us appreciate what this book is all about. 
One word is the word vain or vanity. The English Standard Version says vanity of vanities, and this expression occurs some 37 times in this 12-chapter book. It can be translated as futile, as empty, as void, as meaningless. Life lived apart from God is futile, empty, void, meaningless. One Bible scholar said that life apart from God is like soap bubbles. They're in the air for just a while. They vanish. They are plucked out. They're no more. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it not only deals with this concept of vanity, also it deals with the concept under the sun. Under the sun. And this is found some 28 times in the book. The expression under the sun means the here and now, as though there were no God, no eternity to be faced, no judgment to undergo. Life under the sun is vain and empty and futile because there is an eternity and there is a God. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, another key expression is the word God. It's amazing that this book that in some ways sounds quite negative has mentioned God no less than 40 times. God is mentioned over 40 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. So here is an individual that understands that there's a God, but is living his life as though there were no God and no judgment to be faced. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, an expression that's to be found some 52 times, 52 times now is the expression wisdom or wise. If ever there was a book that really emphasized the New Testament passage in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31, that men's wisdom is nothing but the foolishness of God, it has to be Ecclesiastes, because true wisdom always takes into account that there is a God. When you look at the great book of Ecclesiastes, you see a number of purposes. Purposes that are so important, that are so meaningful. One is this, that life is derived from God, is to be interpreted by God, and that we will ultimately be judged by God himself. Because that is so true, because that is a great principle of life, we need to live and speak, think and act as though there is a God. But here's a second purpose to consider when you look at Ecclesiastes. When God is taken out of the picture, when one lives as if there is no God, all kinds of sin are allowed to enter one's life. There might be the passing pleasures of sin that the writer of Hebrews talks about in the New Testament, but there is a sense of emptiness and purposelessness that is so obvious. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, consider this third purpose. The book of Ecclesiastes is written to remind us that there is such a thing as eternity. There's more to life than this life, this time here on earth. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, there is an emphasis upon eternity. When you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, we understand that eternity is real because of intuition. Intuition, God hath set eternity in our hearts. It seems as if there's just something in us that understands that there must be more to life than life here on earth. But when you keep looking at Ecclesiastes, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 21. And the idea is there's an eternity to think about. And this is a point made by inference. 
The beast goes down into the earth, but the spirit goes up. There is some indication given in Scripture that we are vastly different than other parts of the creation. And this is spelled out by inspiration in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The Spirit goes up to God from which it came. So through intuition, through inference, and through the teaching of inspiration itself, we can learn that eternity is real. And so this life is not meaningless. This life is not without purpose. This life is not vain. It's not empty. There's something to look forward to. We were put on earth to know and love and serve God. And so we could live with him forever in eternity. Looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, we can see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you have the statement of this wise man. Ecclesiastes is sometimes called Koheleth, Koheleth, or the preacher. And the word Ecclesiastes that we see in our Bibles basically comes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And it literally means one who speaks before an assembly, one who speaks before a congregation. In the New Testament, the church is often mentioned, and the word, the Greek word, the underlying expression, is often ekklesia, the word from which Ecclesiastes comes. When you look at Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 11, the thesis is given. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All of one's labors under the sun amount to nothing more than vanity. When you look at Ecclesiastes 1, verse 12, on through about chapter 6, you see the proof given by the writer of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes 1, uh, verse 12, going through the end of chapter 1 and on into chapter 2, what one sees is this. By personal experience, the writer has determined that life is without meaning and vain. He has experimented with wealth, with wisdom and the ways of the world, with power and with prominence. And all of these things he found to be unsatisfying and to be lacking and empty and vain. In chapters 3 through 6, as you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, through personal observation, the wise man declares how he has seen that life lived apart from God is without purpose and meaning. Something is missing that so desperately is needed. Many Bible scholars believe that Solomon was the author of the book of Ecclesiastes. Few would argue that he had the means and the opportunity to, to invest in all of these other things that might give one satisfaction and meaning. And he was in a position to do that as few possibly could. As we look at the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 7 through 12, we see coping, coping with a world that's often confused. And when we think about these chapters, often there are many marvelous pearls, nuggets of wisdom for us to grasp. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, you see again how futile and empty life really is when it's lived as though there were no God, when it's lived apart from God and the lack of an awareness of eternity and standing before God the judge. On one occasion, an atheistic professor made this remark. The meaningless nature and the vain, empty way of life made Ecclesiastes 
the only book in the entire Bible to him that made sense. He was not a believer in God. He claimed to know that there was no God, but he acknowledged that Ecclesiastes would be the only book that made sense. Well, I wish that he had read the last two verses of Ecclesiastes. Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear the Lord and keep his commandments, and that the Lord will judge all. Only in God can real purpose and meaning be found. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it is amazing, astounding how much it says about God. When we look at the book, we can look at it thematically. Sometimes the book deals with the limitations and frustrations of life here on earth. That's a good way to study Ecclesiastes, to look at the theme of the limits and frustrations of life here in the world. But it also deals with pleasure and enjoying life as a gift from God. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the Bible talks about enjoying life with the wife of your youth. When you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it deals with how to deal with neighbors and with relatives and with people. It deals with relationships. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, two are better than one. How true that is. That a cord of three strands is not easily broken. The Bible speaks in the book of Ecclesiastes about how a good name is better than precious ointment and how that better is the day of one's death than the day of one's birth. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Better is the humble than the proud. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9, do not be hasty, do not be quick in your spirit to be angry, because anger rests in the bosom of fools. There's a few passages from the New Testament that will help us appreciate the book of Ecclesiastes even more. A book that deals with the emptiness and the lack of purpose in life when it's lived apart from God. Hear these passages. Philippians 1 and verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What a powerful passage. And this answers the ideas expressed in the book of Ecclesiastes. Again, we might consider Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Set your affection on things that are above where Christ is. If we set our affection on wealth on things, on power and prominence and earthly wisdom, we are bound to be sadly disappointed. Consider this passage from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Ecclesiastes emphasizes the vanity of life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 assures us that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, In Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him. Oh, the emptiness of life apart from God. But oh, the rich, rewarding fullness of life that loves God and honors His will. He has given us all things richly to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. Now let's look for a few moments at the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon an eight-chapter book that follows Ecclesiastes. In looking at Song of Solomon, Adam Clark, a commentator from the 1800s, once made this statement, No young preacher should ever preach from Song of Solomon. Jewish rabbis considered Song of Solomon something of an enigma, a mystery, 
One rabbi describes Song of Solomon as a lock for which the key has been lost. And rabbis, at a very early point, started teaching that no Jewish man under the age of 30 should even read the book of Song of Solomon. What is the book of Song of Solomon all about? It is about God and the greatness of married love. God and the greatness of married love. Now what I want to do is give you four guidelines for appreciating this wonderful book, Song of Solomon. First of all, guideline number one. Song of Solomon is a song. You'll see that in the opening verses of chapter 1. It is a song. It is poetry that has been set to music, and specifically, it is Eastern poetry that has been set to music. It's an important book to look at, but we need to consider the type of literature with which we're dealing. It is poetry set to music, and it's very vivid, it's very sensory, and because of the subject matter, it can be very erotic. It is concerning marital love. It's concerning sexuality in marriage. And so that's an important concept to think about. The book is a, a song, a song. But capture, capture this idea. It is a song about married love, about human love. When we look at the book of Song of Solomon, God is the one who originated marriage and is the one who created sex within marriage. And so what we are dealing with, ladies and gentlemen, what we're dealing with, friends, is a song about human love within the marriage relationship. That's a second guideline to keep in mind. But here's the third one. Song of Solomon is a song about the greatness of married love in the Word of God. What we are dealing with here is part of the very Word of God. Therefore, its message needs to be properly proclaimed. It needs to be properly taught. It needs to be properly stressed. We're not dealing with something that is dirty. We're not dealing with anything that's pornographic. We're not dealing with smut. We are dealing with the precious will of God concerning sex within marriage, concerning the relationship between husband and wife. And then notice this guideline finally. Song of Solomon is a song about human love, married love, and it is part of the word of God given to make us wise given to make us wise. In 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 32, the Word of God says Solomon authored a thousand and five songs. This was the most loved and the greatest hit of all those songs of Solomon having to do with married love as God would have it its expression. As you think about the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, we're dealing with wisdom material, poetry, and so therefore it's very vivid. The senses are appealed to, and certainly that is the case in Song of Solomon. Remember, according to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, Solomon had 700 wives. Oh, if only he'd been true to some of the things that he taught in the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. When you look at Song of Solomon, what you see is this. The book is somewhat difficult to outline, but here's how it unfolds in a broad way. In chapter 1, from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 3 and about verse 5, you have falling in love. A man and a woman falling in love. From chapter 3 and verse 6 through chapter 5 and verse 1, 
You have uniting in love. You have the wedding. You have the, the happy occasion when the two are united in marriage. Beginning in chapter 5 and going through about verse 2, going through chapter 7 and verse 10, an interesting section dealing with struggles in love. Oh my, no matter how much you love each other, there will be struggles in marriage. And then chapter 7 verse 11 through chapter 8, the ending of the book, Growing in Love. There is a marvelous passage in Song of Solomon chapter 8 verses 6 and 7 about the strength and the power of love. That fire cannot quench love. That many waters cannot drown it. What a powerful thing married love truly is. As we look at the book of Song of Solomon, a couple of expressions are helpful. Those who are young are told to be patient and pure and then to express passion in its proper way in marriage, in the marriage bed. And the expression is this, do not stir up or awaken love before it's time. Do not stir up or awaken love before it's time. You'll see this in Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 7, in chapter 3 and verse 5, in chapter 8 and verse 4. Oh, what a powerful message. Be pure and be patient and allow passion to have its proper expression in the marriage bed. And then you'll see in the book of Song of Solomon this expression, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. For example, Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 16 Chapter 6 and verse 3, chapter 7 and verse 4. It's a repeated expression. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. My desire is for him. So there is a proper place for the proper exercise, the appropriate exercise of passion, sexuality in marriage. As we think about this briefly, here are some points of application to consider. Sexual desire is not devilish. It can be expressed in ways that are sinful, but sexual desire is not necessarily devilish. When God created everything in Genesis 1 and 2, it is good, but it wasn't good for man to be alone. I like to think about Song of Solomon as being a book that, uh, that Adam could have possibly been uh, referred to if it were written at that time. And he could have said when Eve was created, this is exactly what God had in mind. So desire is not devilish. Character and chemistry are crucial. Many people marry simply because of a certain amount of physical attraction or chemistry, but character and chemistry need to pro be properly emphasized. It's so important to stress both of these before people marry. Many people get married based on attraction and chemistry only to later find out that their mate, their spouse, lacks character. Seek God. Seek God first, Matthew 6, and let Him be the one who blesses you in your marriage.